Welcome back to the Red Dice Diaries. I'm John. It's been a while since I've put out a video, but I received this in the post the other day. Folk Magic of the Haven Isles. It's a role-playing supplement for magicians and wizardly types in the Haven Isles. Written by Richard Marpole with art, layout, etc. by Glenn Seal of Monkey Blood Design. It's Middlelands compatible, but also compatible with most other OSR games. So let's have a look at it, shall we? Folk Magic of the Haven Isles is a role-playing supplement for magicians and wizardly types of the Haven Isles, inspired by the folklore of the real British Isles. The tome includes 14 magic user subclasses, 16 magic user backgrounds, 7 tomes or spellbook ideas, 16 magical spells, and 4 oddities of the Haven Isles. Okay, so we've got the book. Let's have a look at it and see what's inside. Okay, so we've got a nice cover there. Lovely hardback book, nice and sturdy. If we open it up, plain front sheet. We've got the credits there. As you can see, I paid on the Kickstarter to get the signed version because why not? I'm a fan of supporting content creators like Glenn and Richard. They put out some great stuff. So we can see, first of all, in the introduction here, it describes fantasy novels and role-playing games often give the impression that pra the practice of magic is a single unified art and that magic users in one place are broadly similar to another. In the real world, and certainly in the British Isles, magical beliefs and practices are localised, weird and idiosyncratic. Yeah, and as a native of Britain, I'm looking forward to seeing what stuff we've got in here. So straight on, we're moving on to subclasses, which are intended to give a bit of flavor to your magic user. I was a little bit skeptical of like kits and stuff like that in AD&D 2nd edition, but I'm interested to see what these have to offer. The book describes them as an overlay to place on top of a magic user character or even NPC, giving unique abilities and drawbacks, including spell options. So the first one we have is the Apple King or Queen, where it says apples are a plentiful crop in Havenland and cider is a popular and potent beverage. That's right, it definitely is. And you get some rules here where basically once a day you can make a magic potion effectively, which is like a cider containing one of your spells. And there's a few limits on how many of them you can have active. We've got some lovely looking artwork there of someone picking the apples. However, as one of your weaknesses, you have to eat something with apples in or drink something with apples in once every 24 hours or you take penalties so that sounds great to me and i'm liking there's this little other notes section here where they're saying like oh if you like beer instead of cider here's a few substitutions you can make and it says as an option this could also be applied to druids i could see like the friars of um, dolman ward using like mead or something similar i think that'd be pretty cool we then got the Bog Chanter, which obviously summons uh, images of the old sort of bog mummies, druids, and stuff like that. It says, Bog Chanters know something of the bog's secrets. Perhaps they learn their craft from a vile hermit or a crazed hag with a taste for live frogs. You can't drown in mud bogs or swamps, but you leave muddy footprints unless you make a roll. There's also a strange thing where dead bog chanters have to be buried in a bog or they rise as vengeful mummies that's pretty cool they usually prefer necromantic spells they bleed dirty water instead of blood they get they can learn transmute to rock as a fourth level magic user spell instead of the fifth level version but otherwise it's identical we've got the brog which is like your midsummer night's dream sort of face shape-shifting style characters where they can basically they wear the skin of a donkey and they go through a ritual to become one of these creatures and they can go without sleep they gain dark vision but in order to go without sleep they have to deny other people theirs they cast spells by capering screaming braying howling and frothing at the mouth good stuff we've got the infernal demon slave who gets a familiar and a witch mark and follows a wicked sabbath which is obviously very much drawing on the art, the sort of stereotypical sort of evil witch idea prevalent in a lot of mythology. We've got the fairy bride or bridegroom. Again, some nice artwork. 
And these are people who've spent years, maybe even centuries in the realms of the Fae and probably have an odd perspective on human society as a result. They don't have a spell book, they hold the magic in their minds and some of their magic may actually be Fey creatures helping them out. Who knows? As a result of being in Fairy, they get to roll or pick a result from the improvements and experience table here. And some of those improvements are things like you can't tell a lie, you have to speak in rhyme, and the experiences are things like um, maybe you were set to work in the eternal garden. You can regenerate flowers or herbs with the touch of your hand. Or perhaps you were transformed into a decorative purse. You can swallow up to five pounds of jewellery and coins and regurgitate them at will without damage. That's pretty cool. We've got the green child, which anyone who's familiar with the green child of Woolpit, the... Uh, which is a sort of famous local legend in Britain. We covered it in Purple Worm podcast recently. So big fan of that. Uh, you keep this name even if they grow to adulthood. You get green skin and that's linked into sort of gloomium within the middle. And so you get sort of gloomium deformities and anyone who's around you tends to acquire such deformities as well. Which could be interesting, although I'm not sure how keen other people would be to have one of those in their party. But you never know. There's the Hermetic Magician, you know, the secret scholarly occult studiers, which is pretty much what you'd expect. We have the Masked Dancer, obviously a sort of reference to many of the pagan beliefs in Britain and the old surviving festivals or people don masks, like the Hobby Horse, the, the Dorset Oozer, which is referenced there, and the Hobby Horse is referenced over the page there. And basically each one of these masks when worn gives you different abilities so for example the harlequin mask when you wear it at level one you can learn the level one magic use a spell lesser mirror image which functions just like mirror image but only summons 1d2 images however the harlequin personality cannot escape its constant nature it encourages the bearer to lie mock and joke even when not in their best interests and on the flavour bit, we find out that a mask dancer doesn't have to wear the mask all the time, but they have to wear it to cast spells. They will prance and dance and make odd noises, often animal noises, when casting. And the appearance of spells reflects the mantle's purview. We've got the Pella, who is like a rural folk magician, manufacturing witch bottles and such like to serve their community, conjuring up charms and protections and stuff like that to protect their small villages. We have the Sin Eater, which I only know about because there's a film called Sin Eater. I recommend you go out and watch that if you've not given it a chance. It's quite amusing. And the idea of a Sin Eater is basically someone who, as the name says, eats the sins of people so that they can be relieved of those sins. And you get abilities like Death Sense. You can sense if an NPC is fated to die soon from natural causes. However, you always appear to be chaotic aligned, even if, and you're affected by turn undead, even if you're not chaotic aligned and you're not undead. But if you make a charisma roll, you can always find work eating the sins of the recently deceased in Oldenwall or Havenland settlements who would avail themselves of those services. We have the Spay Wife, uh, a small, hailing from a small cluster of islands to the north of Scotland. There are hardy people with strong ties to the sea and its power. This form of magic is mainly but not exclusively practiced by women and focuses on prophecy and weather divination. So you must spend one hour a day using your art to tell the future or providing readings. You cannot drown in salt water. However, you are hunted by the Nuklavi, a sea demon. Each session, the GM gains a pool of hit dice equal to the level of the highest spell slot the Spay Wife possesses. Each time the Spay Wife is in combat, the GM can spend these hit points to buy extra hostile monsters that are minions of the Nuklavi. So that's an interesting little wrinkle there. So you get these abilities, but you will be set by these strange creatures. And again, there's another nice image there. We have the Stitch Witch, who creates magical cloaks, hats, jackets, and other items of enchanted apparel. We have the slightly grotesque looking toad man who follows a strange path to magical power conducting a ritual involving feeding a 
a strangled toad to a colony of ants collecting its bones and eating them after they've washed down a running stream. It transforms them into this slimy, amphibious-like creature. So you get charisma penalties, but you're immune to all non-magical poison. Anyone who attempts to eat you must make a saving throw because your skin exudes a natural poison. Vampires are immune to this damage, but find Toadman's blood foul and devoid of nourishment. We have the Wizards of the Edge, who is a sort of figure out of time, an archaic figure who tends to an ancient order of armoured knights frozen in time, awaiting Havenland's hour of greatest need. So I'm thinking of the Merlin film with Sam Neill in there, to be honest. And they always appear very archaic, and they're always a stranger, but they're privy to many secrets from the past and future. And we've got a nice double page spread there. Then we move on to backgrounds. Backgrounds drawn from folklore, history and beyond. They don't give any significant mechanical benefits or drawback. They're just there as a bit of flavour to help personalise a magic user and bind them into the middle and setting. So that's things like arcane gloom bugger. You can speak the language of the firefly like gloom bugs and learn their secrets. There's court astrologers, cultists where you follow a mysterious god. Fallen witch finders, goblin stink binders, who can sniff out magic like a pig sniffs out truffles, worm charmers, witches of the cave. All very interesting and could be useful to add a bit of flavour to your characters. There's a random table here, you know me, I love a random table, which says what's weird about this magic user. And it's a d20 table, you can roll on that and you get things from must pass half their food over their shoulder for the unfair folk up to eats people the reasons are complicated well i imagine there would be we then have tomes which is basically a way of describing specific spell books to make them a little more interesting and to tie them into the haven lands setting it offers some details on the history of the different tomes as well as suggested spells that they may contain then we have some new spells so we have things like a stitch in time spell level one you tie a stitched or woven charm to the target's armor or clothes their ac improves by one for every hour as the charm bends time and or fate in their favor the charm is broken if it's removed or destroyed we have cheeky green an inky green cider with a clean and crisp taste not too sweet and not too sour it's rare amongst magic ciders because it allows the drinker to cast the spell rather than suffering its effects. Two coils of bright green energy erupt from the drinker's fingers and fly wherever he wishes within a range of 150 feet. The drinker must roll to hit the target. The rays inflict 1d6 plus 1 points of damage. We've got Create Curse Doll, Find Riches, Find True Love, Gloom Ray, Command Lesser Animal, Speak with Sea Creatures, Transmute Lead to Gold, and then we move on to Oddities. So we have Mandrake, which is a deformed human-like plant creature sprouting from earth that's been watered by the blood of a hanged man. And we've got a nice little picture there again. Once sprouted, they grow far more quickly than humans. They don't grow our age beyond this and are immortal unless slain. And we then have a few sort of little uh, flora and fauna entries. Robin Jade Breast, effectively a, a robin with a green-coloured breast rather than traditional true lava bread a delicacy in olden wall and the wizard hole a tiny pocket dimension scattered across the haven lands and then finally we have book references a glossary of terms which is always useful the ogl and we're on to the end sheet so that's what we have in folk magic of the haven isles okay so what do i think of folk magic of the haven isles well, as a bit of a disclaimer, I'm a massive fan of the Middleland setting as well as Richard and Glyn Seal's previous works. Now, I got this on the Kickstarter, so I got the sort of nice hardback, very sturdy, nice little book. However, it's available as either PDF or soft cover, premium or standard, print on demand on drive through rpg and I'll put a link in the description to this video. It costs around 
$9.42 for the PDF, which is, I think, just over £7 as of the time of recording in UK money. And the soft cover premium is about $23 US. So it's not a massively expensive book. There's not a lot of system stuff in it. It's not a book that's chock full of crunch. However, I don't mind that. It does what it sets out to do and accomplishes it very well. It's just there to add a little bit of flavour to your magic users, to make them a little bit different so that all magic users aren't the same. But there's nothing I could see having looked through this, although drop me a comment if you think I'm wrong, that would actually break your game or unbalance it. Everything where you get a positive has like a bit of a negative or there's sort of like minor difficulties you would have from being one of the types of wizards in here. And it's nice to see the Havenlands, the Middlelands setting, which is obviously inspired by sort of British folklore, drawing more on that. And Richard's obviously looked into that a great deal and sort of presenting that in a game way that's just designed to make your game more interesting without adding a slew of new rules on top, which for someone like myself who thinks that one of the benefits of the OSR games is their simplicity, that's a real big thumbs up as far as I'm concerned. So I would say if you're looking to add a bit of extra interest, a bit of extra flair and a bit of extra flavour to your magic users, as well as getting some interesting extra little bit and pieces, the tome, the flora and fauna, the spells, etc., then you really can't go far wrong with this book. I would advise you to give it a look and pick it up. So that's my thoughts on the folk magic of the Haven Isles, written by Richard Marpole, design, art and layout by Glyn Seal of Monkey Blood Design. Middlelands compatible, OSR compatible. I advise you to go out and have a look at it. If you even have the remotest interest of adding a bit of a sort of British mythological flavour to your magic user. So, until I see you next time, take care, stay safe, keep gaming.